this is, Father. We thank you so much for your grace and mercy at your way today, Father. Thank you for continuing to have your way even when our flesh doesn't want it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 We love you, Austin. A um, couple things on the announcements. Uh, if you have already signed up for baptisms and child dedications, we have not forgotten about that. So just know that we're just kind of praying through when to have those right now. Um, normally around this time, we go to my pastor's church and we, we do uh, baptisms there. But the last two years has been, that water is freezing. I was like, I don't know, man, if I want somebody to die from a... Uh, it was cold. Um, so we're still, you know, we're still praying through that. But if you absolutely want to get baptized and you don't want to wait, we can make it happen. So don't worry about that. Um, and then um, on the side of, there was one more in there. Oh, volunteers. So we haven't forgot about that either. So we have um, usually December, our leadership meetings, we take off the month of December because when we meet in January, we lay out like the whole year in January. And so that gives us kind of clarity of what we're doing next year. So anybody who signed up to be on worship, serving children's, cleaning, any of that stuff, hospitality, um, we're going to be looking towards after the first of the year to actually get you plugged into that. So don't, don't uh, be discouraged if no one's reached out to you yet, all right, because we're just not in that, that space to do that. Um, Ray came and told me we have 69 people in this room. Now, I want you to understand something about this, okay? Half of our church is not here. Like half of the church is not here. Think about that. There was a time when half of the church not being here meant we had 15 people in here. So you think about 70 people and half the church is not here. It's like, because God is doing something in this church, right? So I never want you to, when you come in, and especially if you're, you're here for the first time, to think that, you know, from one service, you're going to get to know everybody. You're not, right? And it takes a lot of time to actually spend time with people in order to build trust and to know that truly they're spirit-filled and you're testing the spirit by the spirit and all that. So coming in one service, whether it's 60, whether it's 120, you're not going to get the fellowship in a church service. I want you to see that, even with 60 people. What do you normally do after the service? You fellowship. That's what most people start doing, right? I think last week and the week before, people didn't leave until like two or something. And it's like, I remember when we first started uh, gathering as a church, many times we stayed and we got pizza and we stayed until six o'clock. You know, and we're, we're still gonna do that. We're still gonna offer that type, of, that type of fellowship. But the reality of it is, is that you're not gonna get fellowship unless you fellowship. Coming into a Sunday uh, time of teaching, it will equip you and it'll give you things that you need in order to go home and into the world and even into fellowship and be able to labor and bear with one another. But unless you're actually in fellowship, you're not going to get the benefits of fellowship. And I've had people come to me and say, hey, why do you guys put such an emphasis on fellowship? I'm like, why don't you put an emphasis on fellowship? When we put an emphasis on everything else, but when we read the scriptures, we, for some reason, we only see it as a teaching, like of, of it telling me something. And we don't see it as a community that we should be modeling after. Amen? So I just want to encourage you in that, that this is not a small church. We're, we're no longer a 20-person church. We're, we're a 120, 130-person church. And not everybody comes every single day. Most people only come to church twice a month, just so you know. So you'll never see that full number in here unless it's like Easter. And then it's like everybody in their families here, right? But just think about that. Where is your fellowship? Where is it? Have you lost it? Have you put it away somewhere? You know, do you have reminders to, to keep you accountable? Do you have certain relationships that will keep you accountable? You don't want relationships where you're just venting. You come in, you vent, you leave. You want relationships where you can carry their burdens too not just people carrying yours, right? So I just want to tell you that I, I feel very strongly that the Lord is uh, getting ready to this next year to really bless this church. And there's some knowledge of that that I know for a fact he is, but I'm talking more on the side of spiritual maturity, right? Spiritual maturity where you can teach these things that I'm teaching, where it doesn't have to be me preaching, 
but you could be teaching it to your friends and your family and your household, and you could be holding each other accountable even more to the deeper truths of Christ, right? So as we come together on Sundays, just to give you a little bit of vision, um, there's times, you know how the Lord moves. There's times where it's like, you know, the sermon's going to get shut down because there's spiritual things going on here and we need to address it, right? That will always be the case anywhere Christ is being preached. But as far as the depths of the truth, you're going to get that inside fellowship and discipleship. You're not going to get that on a Sunday. The deeper things, okay? On a Sunday, we have to continually look at the flesh, continually look at the spirit, continually look at Christ. We have to remind ourselves because you're only getting four a month, guys. And if you come to all services, you'll get 52 out of the year. That's how many times that you get the truth for about an hour. That's why you can't, man, people who say, man, that, that message was an hour. You don't get enough. It should be two hours, Amen. right? But you, but you have to embrace the simplicity of the gospel to the point of refreshing. And then if you want deeper truths and you want more than that, we can get it in fellowship and in discipleship. But on the Sundays, we come for that refreshing. Amen? So I just want you to know I'm, I'm fully committed to... Um, to surrendering this pulpit over time. I'm fully committed to allowing other people to, to share, but not for the sake of, of the flesh, obviously, for the sake of the Lord. And, and it's my calling to empower people and lift people up to fulfill their calling, right? It's not my calling to be the face of everything. It's not my calling to be I'm just being honest with you, to be the rapper, to be the preacher, to be the drummer, to be the, the worship leader, to be the counselor, to be, no. You have gifts and talents. You have abilities that God wants to use. I got real quiet right there. Like, no, I like just sitting here. And use, I'd use you. <laughs> no, you are called and you are chosen and you are to preach Christ and you are to live that out. And I'm to get underneath you and lift you up and equip you so that way you don't fall all over yourself when you're doing it, right? So when I say, speak of myself, I'm speaking of the entire leadership. So I just, it's easier to say me instead of saying us and 30 people, and, right? But I'm speaking of this church. So I want you to uh, just keep that in mind. Let that minister to your heart as we go into this next message in the season of preaching sanctification because what is the main purpose of sanctification? Why are we being sanctified? What is the real reason God is continuing to cleanse us? Wash us, you know what I mean? Like, he doesn't wash us once. He, he washes us daily, right? Constantly. And how many of us have a tendency to go back to our knee-jerk reactions in the flesh, right? Is there anybody here that doesn't need sanctifying work? Come on, how long you been walking with the Lord? Just shout it. How long you been walking with the Lord? Three years, five years, eight, 28. Over here, let's get come over here. How, many, how long you been walking with the Lord? Like from the first time of knowledge of Christ. Let's make it easy. First time knowledge of Christ. Let's take it easy. Like, I don't know, man. Yesterday, I got saved. I, 30 years raised in the church. I got saved yesterday. But in the first time knowledge of Christ, you were raised in it. How long? 20, 37, 25. Where's the angel? Is he sick? I, wanna, I want someone to say three years. <laughs> but the truth is, is that three years. In, <laughs> thanks, Mike. <laughs> the truth is, is in three years, when you first start walking with God, okay, and, and I, I want to give you guys some mercy here because I know a lot of us haven't had the purity that you have now. So I'm, I'm giving you mercy in that. But let's just act as though in the, that time it was pure the whole time. When you first start walking with God, it doesn't take, take long for your flesh to test you. Right? It, it, once you hear about the flesh and the spirit, it's like the flesh attacks right then, like in the middle of the service. Right? So when you start highlighting darkness, darkness goes nuts. But you've been walking with God for however long, and you still got the same flesh doing the same thing every single day. Every day. And if anybody goes, no, nah, man, nah, I'm good. I don't think about things. Like that right there shows you that heart posture shows you that you're lying. <laughs> and you are not keeping an honest track of who you are. That's right, that's right, that's right. Every single day I'm tested by this flesh. Yeah, yeah. If you walk closely with me and you know that I love the Lord, 
You know that God has put his spirit in me. You know that I walk with the Lord. You see me preaching all the time, all the time, to you and to everybody else. Like, if you walk with me, you know that's all it is. This is why some people are like, why do you hang out with that guy? Does he ever not talk about Christ? Can he talk about something else? And the answer is no. Right? I'm not. But it doesn't mean that I'm not tempted to. Right? It doesn't mean that I'm not, that my eyes aren't tempted, that my mind's not tempted, that my heart isn't tempted. There's temptation all around me. Right? So I would never act like I'm not tempted. But what I will say is I'm not giving into it because Christ is the way. So when temptation comes, I'm no longer thrown off by it. And this is what happens in sanctification. You have a couple different things that happen. First, you have impulse where you just, you just cuss. You just, you just lust. You just, right? And because you don't believe God's watching... And you know none of the people who you love are watching because they're not there. You get comfortable in your impulse and you act it out. But God in his mercy says, hey, repent. And you do. And he forgives you. And what happens when he forgives you? You're like, man, this is like the best feeling ever. I'm so glad. I I don't have this burden anymore. Right? But then what happens? You get tested again. And you fall again, and you repent again, and then you're sanctified again. So sanctification has its work, but let me tell you something. Not everybody is in the process of repentance. You might be in the process of sanctification, but you may be stuck in the place of conviction, and you haven't yet come over to repentance. So God keeps a heavy hand of discipline on you. And he doesn't let you get away with anything. And he keeps allowing the conviction to be there. Thank God for conviction. Right? Thank God for conviction. Because I'm telling you, without that, we'd have no spiritual pulse. Right? But what ends up happening, you're convicted. And you believe that repentance in this process of sanctification is merely confession. And so because you simply confess that you know that you're wrong, you think that that's repentance and that's not. It's just confession amidst conviction. So what I want to talk to you about today in this process of sanctification is repentance. I want us to be a church of repentance, not a church of conviction. I want the conviction to lead to repentance. And so I want to talk about the contrast between the two because I think we get comfortable, church. I think sometimes we get in this process of sanctification where we fall And then we repent with words and we fall and we repent with words and we keep stumbling over the same issue. Do you know that the same issue you stumble over is an issue God overcame? So why are you still stumbling over and if you're in Christ? Listen, there's no answer to it. You you should not even try to attempt to answer that. You shouldn't say, well, yeah, why am I broken? (laughs) What's wrong with me? No, what's right with Jesus? Instead of focusing on your failure, you need to look at his success. Instead of looking at your limitation, you need to look at what he overcame. You could not overcome what he overcame. We all understand that now. So instead of falling into the process of, I just keep doing the same thing over and over, recognize that Christ is not doing that with you. Though you are covered in the grace of Christ, Though you are, we're in the work of sanctification. It is not Christ that's falling. He is never falling. We need to come to that. You don't need to look in the mirror. You need to look at Jesus. The scriptures actually say that when you look into the perfect law of liberty, you see what manner of man you are. Watch this. You see who you are. But when you look away, you forget who you were. You forget what you saw. Most people who preach in the flesh will make that about man. They'll say, well, yeah, you look in the mirror and you see yourself. And it's, no, it says the manner of man, you are. That's a double word. There's two things taking place there because you are two different types of people. One is living, one is dead. Say amen. amen. One is living. And one is dead, right? So when you look into this law, 
It shows you the image that you're becoming because you're a believer. You're being made into the image and the likeness of who? Christ. But you also see who you are without him. See, you see that you're, you're evil and, and wicked. So when you're looking into this, you're not supposed to just see that you're a sinner. You're actually supposed to see that, see that you're saved. And when you're underneath the teaching that exposes the flesh, that there's a temptation to want to focus more on the fact that you used to be a flesh person instead of focusing on the fact that you are no longer one. Right? That you can't focus on both with a whole heart. You must focus on one remembering the other. Let me say it again. You must focus on one remembering the other. So you can focus on the flesh remembering that you're saved and you're going to be in a lot of bondage. Well, you can focus on Christ and remembering you used to be lost and you're going to walk in a lot of freedom. Is this too deep? <laughs> it's the truth. So go to Exodus 9 and we're going to talk about conviction for a minute. And I want to take my time. And if you, if you notice, like this is going to, you'll see as God reveals to you the way he has me preaching, there's a reason why he's having me dismantle this this way in more of an a, a, a expository form, right? Teaching you what it is and not just preaching to you like I normally do and calling out things, okay? But there's a, there's a dismantling that's happening in this because repentance is so important to God. Repentance is so important and God does not want us to be a church that goes into perpetual sin in the name of the Lord. He wants us to be a church that is sinless, And he wants, he literally wants me to confront the liar who has come and, and has manipulated the message of God that says you will always sin. No, you will always be a sinner. But you do not always have to sin. I would much rather believe God that he can make me perfect and come up short in purity than living in a way that says, well, I'll always come up short and never strive. I much rather want to strive so Christ would be seen in my life and maybe I come up short and repent from that than to act as if I'll always come up short and never strive. I don't want to be a person who just accepts defeat. No, I want to accept victory. And so God help us move from conviction to repentance and teach us what it really is. In Exodus 9, starting in verse 23, Father, I pray that as I preach, it would be clear. I pray minds would be clear and that you would in fact show us the way to repentance. In Jesus' name, amen. Exodus 9, 23, listen to this, 23 through 28. So Moses lifted his staff towards the sky and the Lord sent thunder and hail and lightning flash towards the earth. The Lord sent a tremendous hailstorm against the land of Egypt. Never in all the history of Egypt had there been a storm like that with such devastating hail and continuous lightning. Uh, first thing I want to say to you is that everything I'm about to share with you is spiritual. Don't worry about the historical account. Let's talk about what God is doing here. You ever have a hell storm in your life? You ever have a, have a time where never in the history of your life have you gone through such depression? It seemed like everybody was turning their back on you. You were turning your back on you. Right? Like a hell storm came. Your finances were never worse. Your body was sick. You ever been through some things? It seemed like the friends that you tried to get rid of are popping up out of nowhere. I mean, everything's, the freaks are coming out at night. Seriously, people knocking on your door, texting your cell phone. You've been free from drugs for who knows how long, and now you can't get away from the offering of it. You never been in a place like that? God told you to give up however amount, amount of money. He said, you need to give away $5,000, $1,000, whatever. And then all of a sudden, everybody's wanting to give you raises. Everything's, and you, you getting tricked. Like, wait a minute, hold on a second. I'm being tempted to worship this thing. You ever been there? 
I mean, I've been on both sides of it. Where I, like, no matter what I did, I couldn't make enough money. And then whenever I was finally done, I was like, you know what? I'm so tired of chasing money. It was like it was coming, like, <laughs> I couldn't shut it off. But both of it was temptation. Both of it was a struggle. And there was this hailstorm in my life. Lightning and thunder, noise and disturbance. And I just couldn't find peace with God. Let me tell you, anytime that's happening, God's getting your attention. When that stuff starts taking place, God is about to tell you something. God's about to provide in a way that you didn't even know you needed. When things start shaking like that, you better just turn to the Lord because he's about to say something. Verse 25, it left all of Egypt in ruins. Sometimes my life was left in ruins, guys. The hell struck down everything in the open field, people, animals, and plants alike. Even the trees were destroyed. The only place without hell was the region of Goshen, where the people lived in Israel. I feel like, you know, as we're, as we're looking at this, I feel like God is trying to get our attention. What he's trying to say is, what are you looking at? What, what the Lord is having us say right now is, what are you looking at? Are you looking at the sky, the thunder, the hail, the lightning? Are you looking at the land, the things that are being destroyed, right? How many of you have been in a position where you think that punishment is coming to you because you sinned? Right, you were full of faith, and then you made a decision and now things start going bad. You're like, it's because I did, because I sinned against the Lord. You guys ever been there? What if I were to tell you that that's exactly what's going on? What if I were to tell you that God is still a God of punishment? Now, for us who are believers, we're not afraid of punishment because we have love that casts out all fear, which fear has to do with punishment. But that fear will be there in lickety split time. It'll be there right there the moment you sear your conscience. And now your eyes are set on the things that are falling apart around you instead of the one that's holding you. There is someone holding you in the midst of all of that. And I just feel like when we think about conviction, and I'm just painting this picture for you because what, what is conviction? What is true conviction from God, right? I just said, what are you focused on? Are you, are you looking at the lightning, the thunder, the problem? True conviction of God is seeing it how God sees it. So some of us have had convictions in here that weren't from God. Because your conviction was actually remorse over the fact that you have to give something up. Your conviction was actually because you had, you had fear in your life. So you think that that conviction that's happening, that feeling of like urgency, which is what most people would call conviction, it's a feeling of urgency. No, no. True conviction is not the feeling of urgency. It's the urgency that sees it as God sees it. Are you listening? It's God saying, Abraham, kill your firstborn, kill your son. And instead of looking at your son and how much you love him, you're looking at what God said to do. That's real conviction. Now you, you tell me, who would be motivated to do such a thing? To give up their life? Who is motivated to give up their life? See, most people operate under conviction that they fight against that reality. They're like, I know God's asking me to give up my life. And in that statement, there's a conviction there that you think is real and honest, and it's not. It's actually deception. I'm going to say it again. I know God wants me to give up my life, but you're not giving up your life. See, you're not on the other side of giving it up. You're just in the conviction of saying, you know he's telling you to give it up. And you never step into giving it up. You're literally at the threshold of freedom, bound. And, it, and this is what it looks like, church, how God sees it. He sees it like Peter on the water. This is how God sees conviction. Oh, Father, help me right now, preach, because we don't want to believe this. We, we want it to be our definition. 
No, I need conviction to step out of the boat. No, you don't. No, you don't. Because that makes no sense. The level of conviction that you think you have doesn't make sense there. Do you understand what I mean? I'm speaking and appealing to the type of conviction you think you have. Well, God's telling me not to go over there because there's danger. How do you know it's God? I see many scriptures that God calls people into danger. We will say that God is convicting us to, to, and we will manipulate ourselves, guys. We will manipulate ourselves in conviction. We will call worldly conviction godly conviction. It's not. It's not. I'm telling you right now, oh, Father, help me preach. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Go, this big old statue, Nebuchadnezzar says, bow. Conviction saw it how God saw it. God's conviction saw how God saw it. Worldly conviction would be like, you know what? I probably should bow. God will forgive me later because I still got the gospel to preach. And you're totally missing the fact that that'll preach by not bowing. That the way God saw it was that there was, a, there was a sacrifice here. And it was you and your faith. And you're willing to sell out yourself in order to bow and spare yourself another day than to see that the Lord is saying, no, give of yourself. Lose your life and serve no other God. I know this is hard because we don't want it to be this way. We want it to be like, no, you know, I'm self-preserving and the Lord put that in me. And so therefore it's true conviction. It's not. True conviction is not self-preservation. True conviction is not self-preservation and it's not preservation in any way because God is in need to be preserved. I'm hearing this when, when God brought me to this. How do you see this, Tony? Watch what 27 says. Then Pharaoh quickly summoned Moses and Aaron. This time I have sinned. Listen to what Pharaoh says. Now, Pharaoh thought he was a god. And out of his mouth comes true godly conviction. Wait a minute. How can someone have godly conviction and not be saved? Hmm. I think some of us underestimate the power of God. Amen. The God knows how to make the devil bow his knee. Every knee will bow. Even demons know that Jesus is Lord. Right? So God knows how to make godly conviction fall upon the most heinous person and say things like i have sinned he confessed the lord is the righteous one and my people and i are wrong whoa pharaoh said what when's the last time you said that when's the last time you and i said i'm wrong i sinned against you lord I'm wrong. I said things that I shouldn't have said. I'm wrong. I'm living how I shouldn't live. I'm wrong. See? But we don't want to be like Pharaoh, guys, because that conviction that keeps you there but doesn't pull you into repentance, that wasn't enough to save him. It, it was not enough to save Pharaoh. Simply admitting that you're wrong is not repentance. Repentance. Listen, if admitting you're wrong was repentance, Pharaoh would have been saved. Because then it would have made God true, right? Listen to what, what his heart posture was in verse 28. After he says, me and my people are wrong, he says this. Please beg the Lord to end this terrifying thunder and hail. We've had enough. I will let you go. You don't need to stay any longer. The heart posture of Pharaoh was this. Just stop punishing me. I'll give you what's yours as long as I don't have to suffer anymore. What a difference between him and Jesus. Jesus did, aren't you thankful Jesus didn't do that? On the cross, suffering, going, all right, 
I'm done suffering, Father. No, he said, it's, it's necessary. Because the way God saw it, if Pharaoh had true repentance, he would have accepted the punishment. He wouldn't have asked God not to punish him so he could stop suffering. He would have said, this is right. I deserve this. What did the thief say on the cross? We deserve this. Come on, church, help me right now. I know this is sobering. But there is a difference between having conviction and admitting you're wrong. Even demons know Jesus is Lord. There is no greater confession than to acknowledge his lordship. But that is not enough to save them. Simply admitting that he's right is not enough to save you. Go to Numbers chapter 20. I wrote this down. You know, I said conviction is seeing it as God sees it. But then I wrote this down. Conviction is the desire to want to obey God. It is not obedience. So Numbers chapter 20 will give us a small example of this. I know when people said, man, he's going to talk about repentance. You probably had a different idea of what I was going to talk about. But in order for repentance to take its root, in order for that seed to go in, we have to uproot the lie. The lie that conviction is enough. It's not enough. Numbers chapter 20, verse 6, watch this. Moses and Aaron turned away from the people and went to the entrance of the tabernacle where they, they fell face down on the ground. Then the glorious presence of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, you and Aaron must take the staff and assemble the entire community. As the people watch, speak to the rock over there and it will pour out its water. You will provide enough water for the rock to satisfy the whole community and their livestock. So Moses did as he was told. So Moses did as he was told. Interesting. He took the staff from the place where it was kept before the Lord. Then he and Aaron summoned the people to get, come and gather at the rock. Listen, you rebels, he shouted. We must bring you water from this rock. Then Moses raised his hand and struck the rock twice with the staff. And water gushed out. Can you just say God is faithful? He's faithful. He'll never forsake his people. So the entire community and their livestock drank their fill. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust me enough to demonstrate my holiness to the people of Israel, you will not lead them into the land I am giving them. This place was known as the waters of Meribah, which means arguing because there the people of Israel argued with the Lord and there he demonstrated his holiness amongst them. Conviction is, is the desire to want to obey God. It's not obedience. Moses heard the word of the Lord. God said, speak. But in his own, whatever you want to call it, I would say anger. God wanted to show the people mercy. Moses was a vessel of God. When people looked at Moses, they saw the law. They saw the leading of, it was, it was a Christ figure, right? They saw a savior of sorts because he was the one leading them out of Egypt. He was, a, he was the face of God to the people. God did not want to demonstrate anger to them. He wanted to demonstrate mercy. He wanted to demonstrate his power that only by my word, it is not by power nor might, but by my spirit, by my word. And instead, Moses took it upon himself in his anger to say, you rebels, and strike the rock twice. There was disobedience amongst conviction. Come on, you know you've done it. And some of us wonder why we continually fall into sickness. Some of us wonder why we continue to fall into punishment. Some of us wonder why we're not walking in victory and in liberty. Right? I may not be speaking to you. Everyone here may be walking in victory. But I'm speaking as if. 
Right? I have to speak that way with this word because there may be somebody here where the Lord is really dealing with you. And he's saying to you, you have disobedience amongst conviction. And because of that, you have the results that you have. You will always, you will always try to find peace in money. You're always trying to find peace in this world because you have conviction but no obedience. Now, the good news in that is that Moses was saved. He, God did not take away eternal life from him. Man, somebody should say amen to that. That should comfort you somewhat. But he did lose something. And you want to know what I know it was? It wasn't the fact that he didn't get to go into the promised land. See, that would be our carnality talking. Well, I would want to eat that fruit and drink that honey and, and the, man, the land. Right? I would want to, no, that's, that's the carnality talking. He missed the relationship of, of displaying God's holiness. He didn't get to be used to be shown as a vessel of mercy or honor. He was used as a vessel of dishonor in that moment. And he will always be remembered for that. Now, I'm not going to go too deep on you, but it had to be that way. Okay, it had to be that way. And I'm, I'm going to give it to you. Like I said, in fellowship, we can go deeper in this. But I, it had to be that way because he was not Christ. So because he was not Christ, there had to be disobedience there. Otherwise, the message of Christ makes no sense for Moses. But the message of Christ has to make sense for all of mankind. So the beauty in this is that God has not let you go. But the Lord is still desiring for a church that will be a, a church of repentance and not just a church of conviction. Conviction without repentance can cause you, watch this, to deny others what God has freely given you. Did, did Moses not see the holiness of God? Did his face not turn white from the glory of his I mean, come on, like, like, did Moses not have an encounter with God? There was holiness displayed to Moses, but he denied the people what was freely given to him. This is what makes Jesus' message so amazing is because he does not deny us what the Father has given him. He gives us freely, listen, what the Father has given him. And what is the Father giving him? The Father. Part of the reason why you're only a, some of you are only conviction-based is you have no relationship with the Father. You haven't made that transition yet to know that the most valuable possession you have is him. His holiness, his likeness. That's the most valuable thing you have as a believer. Living in your being, exuberating through you. This is why when people talk about you, right, as a Christian, it really doesn't matter. What can they say? You're in full relationship with God. What can mere men do? See, I don't want to deny you the holiness that I've been given. This is why I tell you to give up things. This is why I encourage you to give up your life. This is why I tell you to sever the darkness that's in your life. It's because I want you to have what's been freely given to me. And if you have that, you'll do that for everyone else too. And you won't care if you're called names for it. Conviction without repentance can cause you to deny others what's been freely given to you. Go to Matthew 18. Man, Lord. Huh? Glory to God. Oh, Father, I praise you right now. Glory to your name, Lord. You are shaking everything inside of our human being bodies. You are shaking everything inside of our human being minds. You are destroying every argument that rises up against you. And I thank you, Lord, that you are freeing us right now in Christ's name. You are merely a human being until you're born again. You are no longer human. When you are born again, you are a foreigner. You are no longer of this place. You're passing through. You're living for God. You're holding to Christ. You're walking in freedom. But conviction without repentance, it will cause you to deny others what's been freely given to you. The amazing thing about God Man, Father, the amazing, the amazing thing about God is he still won't strip salvation from you. 
Your salvation is not earned. It's given. So if you are living in that place of conviction with no repentance, you might ask yourself, well, wait a minute, I have to repent to be forgiven. There's a difference between initial repentance and ongoing repentance. Your initial repentance to Christ as the only way, truth, and life, the power source, the one that saves you, saves you. You don't need to do anything else from there. And it is the fact that he saves you that you have, you're even hearing this message and feeling convicted to the point of wanting to repent. It's the fact that you are saved that's causing you to be uncomfortable in your sin. You see? But if you never turn from your sin and you are continually wrestling with God, you're still going to be saved. Somebody goes, wait a minute, you can't lose your salvation? Show me where you can. You will make God a liar. You can lose it. No, people walk away from the faith, but they don't lose their salvation. Amen. People end up going back into the world and all that, but they don't lose their salvation because they can't even sin the same. I've said this many, many times. They, there's some people in the streets right now addicted to meth and alcohol, but their addictions are not stealing their salvation from them. As a matter of fact, it's tormenting them. So there's only two ways to live saved. And one is to be living in complete torment. The fact that you have received Christ as your Lord and Savior, you know every day you're pinning him to the cross again. Or you live in the continual freedom that it brings. But it is 100% fact that there are people who have been saved and have fallen away from the faith and yet God still keeps them. Crazy, right? And I can show the scriptures for it. I can, I, can, I can defend that really well, but there's one scripture that stands out more than any, and I've quoted it many, many times. And it was when in Corinthians when Paul actually says about the young man who's sleeping with the stepmom. And he says, hand him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh so that he may be saved on the day of judgment. Says, but you tell me what kind of Christian you want to be. See? A person of conviction who lives in perpetual sin does not necessarily mean they're not saved. I'm telling you guys the truth. The world doesn't want, religion definitely don't want to hear that. But it was Jesus that came for the sinner. It wasn't religious people, was it? It was Jesus that looked that woman in the eye when she was caught in the act of adultery and said, neither do I judge you. And then he didn't give her a list of rules after that, did he? No, as a matter of fact, he went, on to de- he went on to describe what adultery really was. It wasn't you with the physical body, it was someone else with the physical, it was the heart yeah. that turns away from God. Yes. And there's another thing I have to say. There are many pastors and many preachers who hate that I'm saying this because they think that I'm giving people a license to sin. The truth of the matter is, if it's in you already, you're gonna do it anyway. If it's already in you to make an excuse to go back to your old life, there's nothing I'm going to say to stop you. But where I come accountable is if I preach the truth about who Christ actually is. And what I will say to the person who wants to walk away and go back into the world, he will not let up. God is going to make your life miserable. Yes. One thousand percent. I never, I've never met a Christian who has come into the knowledge of Christ and then went back as if they didn't experience him. Never. You know what I find? I find them out there and just like, yeah, you know, God still loves me. I don't want to do what I'm doing. And they're in torment because the truth and the holiness of God torments you if you're not living in that holiness. Papa was preaching this morning about going to hell. I'm going to read this in a minute. But Papa was preaching this morning about that there's, there's a hell. Everyone has eternity, either heaven or hell. And everyone's on their way to hell until they come to Christ and they experience heaven. But there was the, the rich man, and, and he's saying, I'm hot. I need something to drink. Well, that's what it's like when the truth is right there in front of your face all day long. But notice what that man said. He said, why didn't anybody tell me? So he was not a man that had been told. And he was not a man that knew the truth. He was a man that said, you know what? I'm here now. I didn't know how I got here, but I'm here, and no one told me, even though he was fully accountable. He said, send them back to tell my family, because he knew they needed to be told. 
That's what happens to people. The truth is told to them, and now they're living in constant torment because they're convicted but not repentant. They were repentant enough to believe upon Jesus. They're not repentant enough to live for him. This is so counter Christianity, what Christians preach about today. But I, I mark my words, and I guess we'll find out when we get there. But when we get to heaven, there's going to be a whole lot of people you didn't expect to be there. And people that you thought should be there, they're going to be in hell. It's the truth. So I'm not making a license to sin. I'm not saying that people, it's impossible to come to Jesus and not have your life changed. Like if you come to Jesus, you have your life changed. Now you can't sin the same. It just is what it is, right? So it's, it's an absolute fallacy to think that I can preach a message that would allow people to continue to believe that they're gonna be saved and they can keep sinning. It's ridiculous. I would have to stop preaching Christ to create a church like that. But conviction without repentance will cause you to deny others what has freely been given to you. Now, did God wait for you to be free to free you? So why are you denying other people freedom? Did God wait for you to be right to save you? So then why are you requiring people to be right? You see, is God's mercy not enough? mercy is enough. I'm just going to paraphrase Matthew 18, 23 through 35. You can read it later if you want. It's a powerful parable. But Jesus talks about this king who decides to settle his accounts. And he calls a man who owed a great amount of money, we'll say a million dollars, owed a lot of money. And the man fell to his face because he knew that he couldn't come up with it. And he said, Oh, give me time. Forgive me for this. I, I owe you a lot. Just give me time and I promise I'll repay you. The king felt pity on him. And instead of saying, okay, I'll give you time, he says, I forgive you of all the debt. That man gets up from that forgiveness and goes and begins to find people that owe him money. And he comes to the one that owes him money and he says, you need to pay me up now. And that man pleads with him, give me time, give me time. And he said, you've had plenty of time, lock him up. And he had him thrown in jail. The servants saw what happened. They were upset. So they went back to the king and told him. And the king was so furious that he brought that man back and he threw him into torment until he could pay back his whole debt. This man was convicted for himself, but he was not convicted for others. True godly conviction will have you see that any conviction on your own life is a reflection of the conviction that should be on other people's lives. You're not just worried about yourself anymore. You care about others. Why do I go to fellowship? Because I want others to have it. And in that, I get it. I can't be selfish in my walk with God and think that I'm gonna slide through. No, your salvation's there, but you ain't sliding. You're going to be accountable for everything you say and do. And is he not right to do that? He's the judge. Do you think you're not, you think you ain't going to be judged, brother and sister? Oh, you got a list that has to be brought into account. Everybody will be judged according to what they have done. Do you see how like if, if we were judged according to what we have done with apart from salvation would go to hell? But because salvation's mark is upon you, that means the initial repentance of believing upon Christ is upon you. God is so good that he will not disqualify you because then he would have to make himself a liar. But no, he sits and says that. You got a long record, but salvation's keeping you. And that's what makes his mercy shine. What would you say if Judas actually went to heaven? I know many of you believe he went to hell. How do you know? Do the scriptures say so? How do you know? 
And it's supposed to be that way. Anybody who says they know doesn't know. The person who says, surely he went to hell because he betrayed Jesus. Well, didn't you? Well, surely he went to hell because, you know, he denied Jesus. Well, didn't Peter? No, but you know what it is, Tony? He, he hung himself. He committed suicide. Are you saying God's grace isn't enough? Are you saying that God portioned his grace only to the lifespan of a human being? Might I remind you that when Jesus went down into the grave, he actually preached in a place called purgatory where all the souls from the flood and everything else were left there for him to come and preach the gospel to them. You know they had no mortal body when he preached the gospel to them. Is this too deep? God has the power to do anything and he can save anyone he chooses. But repentance, what I look at the story of Judas, and I'm not saying he's saved, but I saw a man who came to the realization that he did something terribly wrong. That he knew he had killed the Messiah. And I saw a man take his own life because of that torment, because of that reality. If he truly didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah, he would not have killed himself. But because God revealed to him that he did what he did, he could not handle it in his human reason. The Lord allowed him to go crazy and he took his own life. You telling me God couldn't have stopped him? See, I'm challenging the conviction because there's a difference between repentance and conviction. If you're somebody of repentance, you know it's a lifestyle, it's not a moment. You know you need him now. Now, I'm not saying he was saved because I don't know. But what I am saying is God could save him. Otherwise, he would be a God of limitation instead of a God of limitless power. So what is repentance? Repentance is treating life as God treats it. It's, it's like when you look at repentance... And you think of like the moment of turning from yourself to the Lord. That's the true dying, right? Like that's the true death. The death is not that you just stop doing something. Man, I'm, I'm hoping I'm bringing some clarity to you, right? Because there's people who think that, that like repenting, repenting and turning to God is that I once did this and now I do that. No, those are some of the results of repentance. But repentance itself is literally dying with Jesus and raising with Jesus. It's the old life being crucified and the new life being risen. That's, that is repentance. It's not just saying, I know I did wrong. It's saying, because I'm wrong, here's now what I'm doing. Lord, you suffer, I suffer. You got a cross, I got a cross. You live, I live. As you live, as I live. Like, it's an, it's an emulation. I'm not trying to make it something else. Repentance is, is the very fuel of obedience. Remember when David slept with Bathsheba? If he was simply full of conviction, he'd have slept with a different one. He wouldn't have got up from that place with change. Because when Nathaniel came and called him out on it, he fell down and he, and he repented. He didn't just confess his sins. He said, I'm not going back. I'm, I'm so worthy of punishment and you are worthy to judge me. And God, you show me your mercy. And what happened? That mercy fueled him, empowered him, and he went forward into obedience after that. So every act of obedience after that was fueled off a place of repentance. See, we want to make it a, a work. We want it to be a moment-by-moment moment thing. I need to repent of this. I need, this is ridiculous. You, can, you will never repent of enough things. Do you know how much sin your flesh produces? you know how much disobedience your flesh produces? You will never repent enough. So then it's not a matter of, did I repent of every single thing and every thought? Because you're going to drive yourself crazy. You're going to be in your car going, oh, forgive me for saying stupid. Forgive me for saying this. I mean, you're going to drive yourself crazy. But instead, the secret to repentance is, what do you want me to do, Lord? I will live for you. I will do what you want me to do, Lord. 
It's an, an act of obedience, which is fueled by that. So because by nature, and, and I, I remember when I was writing this down, like the Lord was speaking to me, by nature, are you obedient or disobedient? Disobedient? So then repentance moves from disobedience to obedience. So by nature, you're disobedient. So every act of obedience is off the fueling process of repentance because by nature, you are disobedient. So every act of obedience is literally repentance fueling you on because you're not being disobedient anymore. There's no way to be obedient without the possibility of being disobedient. And there's no re re way ever to be in Christ without first not being in Christ. So I said this, repentance is treating life as God treats it. And repentance is the first fruit of obedience. And just real quick, go to Matthew 3. Are you getting anything out of today's message? Is it all over the place or is it just hitting the same thing? Because I, I feel like I'm hitting the same thing in different ways. But I, I want God to stir within you the reality that you're not saved by your own by your own self and it's not conviction that saved you it's repentance because repentance is the work of god matthew 3 verse 7 but when he saw many pharisees and sadducees coming to watch him baptize he denounced them and this is john the baptist saying you brood of snakes he exclaimed who warned you to flee the coming wrath Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. <clears throat> Prove by what? Say it. You need to say it for yourself. Pro prove it by the way I live. That means no more cussing. That means no more excuses for your cussing. What's worse, the cussing or the excuse to cuss? Why are you making excuses for your flesh? Could it be that you have conviction with no repentance? What if that was the thing that's keeping you from all the promises God has for you? Look, I'm not one to work to preach like this punishment thing, but there is punishment, guys. You know that God is greater, but I have to say this to you. Maybe that's why you're sick. Look, I get it. Sometimes you're just going get, to get sick. But why are you sick all the time? Why, why, why is there chronic sickness? Could it be a demonic presence? Could it be that your conviction, no repentance? Could it be that you're just saying you're wrong, but you're not changing? The scriptures talk about it. This is why some of you have, have fallen sick and even died because you're dealing with sexual immorality. But for some reason, I'm the bad guy for preaching today. I, no, the truth of the matter is, is there's such thing as repentance and power. There is such thing as, things as living in the promise of God. You know what I mean? I might fall sick. It doesn't mean that I'm sinning. But what I'm saying is what if your sickness was a cause of your sin? Do you get what I'm saying? You have to consider that. Listen, people fall under condemnation. People fall under these different things of, of bondage because they're not repenting. That's why. They want to act like it's, oh, they just listen to the devil, just attack them, you know. But why are you listening to the devil? Because you have, you have not repented. Okay. Somebody say amen, because in the repentance, it's, it's the way you're living. It's the way you're living. Some, some of us, I've been preaching Christ for years, but you still live the same way you did before. You just now have the knowledge of Christ. I mean, God just has had me just saying some hard stuff today, but it's the truth. And, and God wants us to be convicted to the point of repentance. Repentance is the only proper response to God's goodness. Go to, just real quick, go to 1 John 3, and then we're going to go to Acts 3. So 1 John 3, I'm almost done. I want to leave us just a little time to talk. 1 John chapter 3. And I believe it's verse five and six. First John three, five and six. And we'll just start with four. 
Everyone who sins is breaking God's law for all sin and all sin is contrary to the law of God. And you know that Jesus came to take away your sin, our sins and there is no sin in him. Amen. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. Anyone who continues to live in him will not sin. Whoa. I mean, let, let's just, let's just hold on there. Like, I mean, we can't call the Bible a lie. Yours says will not, right? But anyone who keeps on sinning does not know him or understand who he is. Whoa. Dear children, don't let anyone deceive you about this. What pe when people do what is right, it shows that they are righteous, even as Christ is righteous. Well, brother, I got sin in my life. I keep on sinning. So does that mean I don't know God? Now I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you. In that area, yes. In that area of your life, you don't know God. It's why you do it. You don't know him. Because if you knew him, you wouldn't sin. But do you know that the purpose of that is not so that way you could try to become righteous? It's so you could repent. That's what's amazing about God is he'll say this. He'll say, hey, if, you, if you're still sinning, then you don't really know me. And we'll go, well, then I, what's, what's my life, <laughs> right? We'll get dramatic. What about that time I felt your presence? Then that was God showing himself to you. What about that time that I thought I, I, what I thought was right, I, I admit is now wrong. What about that? I still admit it's wrong. Then, then God showed himself to you. But what about this area that you keep falling short in? Where is God in that? Is it possible that you could know him in certain areas of your life and not know him in other areas of your life? If that's not possible, then you've arrived at perfection. It has to be real. There has to be areas in your life that God has not taken residence in or otherwise you're God. And I'm telling you as somebody who's been walking with God for a long time and I'm living in the time of my life right now by the grace of God, I am living in the light of God. I'm living in the spirit of God. I'm not over here compromising, living this. I'm not. By the grace of God, I'm not perpetually sinning. By the grace of God. But he somehow keep showing me that I don't know everything. <laughs> so as I walk in more with God and as I sin less in Christ, I still find a deep need for him. Yes, amen. Areas that I don't know him. And that's why you need to come out from religion and works so you can receive the grace of God because the grace of God says, I can free you daily. The grace of God says, I'm sanctifying you daily. Less of you and more of me daily. That's the grace of God. Not stop doing that and then you know me. It's not works. Is this making sense? For the one that it might be confusing, let me give you some insight. It's because you're still loving this world. You still have a hold on something and something has a hold of you that's not, you're not free and so instead of hearing the beauty in this message and the glory to God in this message, you're, you're troubled because you don't want to give up your life. Listen, I'm not the one who wrote these scriptures. God wrote these scriptures. But go to Acts 3 and then we're going to close. I know that, that even earlier when I said, hey, God will keep somebody from falling away. Like there's people who are going to be bound in certain sin activity, but yet their soul is still going to be saved. Like it's just the truth, guys. Oh man, can I just even bring more clarity to that? What caused the flood? What was it? No, no, what, not who did it, but what brought the judgment about? Sin. Okay, okay. So they died in their sin. But Jesus still went and preached to them. 
So you know, you know how arrogant the flesh is? Well, that's just a one-off, brother. That's just a one-off. God will never do it again. No, he said he'll never flood the earth again. He didn't say he wouldn't save people again. I'm serious. Like, if they could die in their sin, but yet still have the gospel preached to them, how merciful is God? We're the ones that are like, well, they're dead. I guess they have no more chances. Once you die, if you don't confess Jesus before you leave that body, you have no more chance to be saved. Where do you see that in Scripture? Now, the reason, the reason why this is dangerous to preach is because you have people who are in the flesh that then take that and they live by it. Look it, you're not going to be saved by that understanding. God will use this as a great stumbling stone in your life or a stepping stone. Like, there's only two ways this word goes. And if your heart being evil says, man, Pastor Tony said that I can live however I want and die in my sin and still be saved, God have mercy on you. Because that is not what I'm saying. I would never take that risk. I would never live like that. The Holy Spirit won't allow me. And if there is some spirit in you telling you to do that, it ain't the Holy Spirit. This is such an easy gospel to understand. But you're going to see something in Acts 3, I think, is very powerful in verse 17 through 20. And it says this. Friends, shoot, after this message, we may only be a church of 60 people now. Shoot. <laughs> I realize that what you and your leaders did to Jesus was done in ignorance. But God was fulfilling... But God was fulfilling what all the prophets had foretold about the Messiah, that he must suffer these things. Six, in, uh, verse 19, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord and he will again, say again, Send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. I think that what we're finding in this is that this, this life of repentance is a life that doesn't count do's and don'ts, rights and wrongs. We're no longer taking inventory, right? We're not trying to just examine ourselves for the sake of examination, but we're looking for the Lord. A person who has repentance in their heart active is a person who's constantly looking for the Lord. See, he, he, the call was turn to the Lord. Did you see that? Because you cannot repent without looking at him. The call is turn to Jesus, turn to Jesus, turn to Jesus, turn to Jesus, live for Jesus, walk with Jesus, love Jesus, receive Jesus, believe in Jesus. Make it about Jesus. This is the repentance. It's turn to the Lord. Not turn to yourself. Turn to the Lord. And here's, and I'm just, I'm going to leave it right here. There's, there's a couple different types of sinners, okay? There's the unbelieving sinner. There's the conviction only sinner. And there's the repented sinner. The unbelieving sinner the conviction-only sinner, and the repented sinner. You can just pray about what that means to you, okay? But the unbelieving sinner is just somebody who doesn't, doesn't have God, doesn't have the Holy Spirit. They're lost, many of those people in the world. The conviction-only sinner is the lukewarm Christian. Their only conviction. They, they don't never turn away from their sins. That was me for the first 10 years of my, my walk with God. I was just conviction only. I felt like I wanted to be different, but I didn't live different. And I was definitely not living for God. I was living for myself. The repented sinner is somebody who has been filled with the Holy Spirit and now lives a renewing life constantly. That's the repented sinner. That's the sinner that goes from uh, not knowing the word to knowing the word. Like being used by God to evangelize and preach and teach and do like really be effective for the kingdom of God. That's the one that's in repentance. But have you ever met people who 
the only strength they have is their eloquent speech. Like their words don't match the character. Right? Have you ever been that person? Your words don't match your character. Right? Your character is a lot more shallow than your words are deep, right? So your words are deep, but your character shallow. Like this is, this is the reality of a, a lukewarm life. God's going to spit that out of his mouth. Right? He's not going to hold on to that. He's going to spit that out of his mouth. Most people say, well, when, if he spits them out, then that means they're not saved. Listen, you're not useful for the kingdom of God. There's a difference between being saved and going to heaven like the thief on the cross and then being left in the earth for a work that God can use for you to be able to reach people for the kingdom, right? You will not be useful for the kingdom of God being lukewarm. If you come to me and you want me to affirm you and your calling and things like that, the first thing I'm looking at is, are you lukewarm? Because I know if I commission you lukewarm, I'm setting you up for destruction. Doesn't mean that the gift ain't there, the call ain't there, that there ain't some conviction there, but what, there still ain't no repentance. I can't commission you. How can I commission you if you're still bound? Why would I do that to you? You're going to try to cast out a devil and it's going to overtake you. Why would I do that to you? You don't think there's real principalities, real demons, real things that we face? Absolutely. You think fasting and prayer is a joke? No, it's not. You think a walk in this, walk out ain't real? It is real. I have to sacrifice myself all the time. All the time. My, my life has to be devoted to the Lord. I can't play lightly with this because there is such thing as real repentance. And I am a man of repentance because I'm not living like I used to live. I'm not bound by what used to bind me. You know, February will be 10 years when God loosed the chain of greed out of my life. I was gambling hard, guys. I didn't care about anybody else. But God broke that off of my life. And you know, now I'm breaking that off of other people's lives because I'm free. Repentance. My prayer is that you would stop just confessing your sins. But that you would live in the victorious life of Christ. Hmm. You need to pray for me. I'm going to tell you some of the questions that I'm going to end up getting. Well, what's the point of preaching then, Tony, if God does all the work? They don't know God. Well, why, why do people even need to try to be good if, if everything that they do means nothing? These are questions that I get. Well, you just don't understand God. God gets glory out of the life of a person. Well, what's the point of, of, of choosing then? What's, I mean, just all kinds of human reason type questions. And it's like, man, do you not look upon the face of Jesus and see a finished work? Do you guys not look at this cross and see a finished work? That there is nothing left to be done? From the very beginning of this church, I've been telling you, you don't do to get. You get, and then you do. So everything that you get from Christ is done through your life, that makes sense. But if you're operating from the place of, I have to stop this to get that, you don't know God. No, you get God and you stop things. That's actually what happens. message was for you, brother. These hands should be used to serve the Lord, not to please yourself. Amen. Why are we here? we doing what's this for guys why am I preaching why are you here Why are you here? If 
that isn't for him, may God help you. May God help you live for him. So, if there's anybody here that this message is like you're, you're not just convicted to the point of no change, but you're literally like, no, this is me. This is why God had you preach this message. You guys know I don't, I'm not one, I'm not looking for affirmation. Okay, I, I'm not looking for your affirmation. Your hand doesn't affirm me of my calling. I'm going to do this regardless. God is the one that affirms. But if you, and you should not be embarrassed of this, because if you can't confess now in front of people, what makes you think that you're going to stand with him? Right? But if, if this message was for you, if God had me write this out because it is meaning you just raise your hand right now and just keep it there because I want to pray with you. Okay? Because this is important. Like this is important. Father, with our hands raised, we're asking you, God, to have mercy on us. We also praise you that your salvation is stronger than our doubt. And you know how to make us believe. Will you forgive us of our sins? Father, we feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit that we have to take action and raise our hands. But God, please don't let us think that that's enough. We know you're enough. And so right now we ask that you carry us through every step of every day and that we would not be people who are overtaken by condemnation, but that we would have the conviction of the Holy Spirit to the point of change. Father, we give up our lives now. We're surrendering our desires, Lord, the things that have entangled us. We're throwing them off right now in this moment. By the raising of our hands in unity before the Holy Spirit and before the Father, we're saying, Jesus Christ, set us free. Set us free, Lord. Don't let us go backwards, but instead let us lean forward into you. Let us become more like you and let us live for you. Help us to lead those that are struggling. Help us to lead our families and lead this world. Help us to be living examples of you leading us. I'm asking, Father, for your grace to be sufficient. Thank you for the unity that's here. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Glory to God. Love each other and mean it, right? This, listen, you ever have a deep tissue massage? You ever felt like sick afterwards because they released all those toxins? You guys ever felt that? That type of deep tissue? You're going you're gonna to feel some things after this. You're going to go home and life is going to be there and those toxins that are being released from your spirit is going to start making you feel. You need to rest in the Lord. Don't get easily tripped up because your toast gets burnt, right? Because life happens. But also, listen, also beware of the enemy that will try to tell you that you can live however you want. Beware of that because the sanctifying work of God doesn't let you do that. You are not able to live however you want. Amen. I love you. I pray God bless you today. Amen. Amen.